There we are. That's that's the f that's where we started. Thirty lines of television. That's the uh, BBC's. Well, yes, it is. It says BBC up there. You can just read it. Very first test signal. But um, then we went jumped straight to high definition television. As you can see, this plaque on the side of Alexandra Palace in uh, 1936. We launched the world's first high definition television service. Um, of course. We've redefined what high definition is a few times since 1936, but um, that's what it was in 1936. Uh, we got up to three megacycles per second. Um, then 625 line, um, black and white, and we added colour. And I, I have the honour of being the custodian of the original high-resolution scan of that image, which uh, leads me into some interesting things in the BBC. Of course, we then went to widescreen, and then high definition, and we had 1125 lines in Europe, and the Japanese had 1035 lines. This is what the European cameras looked like, uh, tube cameras, three tubes, and uh, quite big cameras at a time when cameras generally had got quite a lot smaller. Then we decided that we should have a common image format across the whole world, um, 1920 by 1080, and the cameras got smaller, we got camcorders, and we could start actually, they've got even smaller now, there's one at the back there, but uh, they have got a lot smaller over the years. What is Ultra HD? Now, that's a very good question, and at a recent conference I was speaking at, someone fed me a line just beforehand, which was, when we know where the fence is, we'll be able to sit on it. But at the moment, we don't even know where the fence is in terms of ultra-high definition. So is it 4K? Well, no, that's four degrees above absolute zero, so it's not 4K. Is it four with a little k? Uh, that means 4,000 in computer terms. Well... No, because it's actually 3,840 rather than 4,000 and whatever it is. Um, so actually, UHD 1, because there are two flavours of UHD, Ultra HD, UHD 1 and UHD 2. So the first version is UHD 1, which has this resolution, progressive scanning. 4K digital cinema is... 4K, and is 4,096 by same height. So, uh, yet again, digital cinema are trying to be one better, but um, it really makes very little difference. UHD 2 is 7,680 by 4,320, and I'll talk a bit more about what we've been doing on that later. I know one or two of you here have already seen it. Um, but confusingly... UHD2, which is 7,680 horizontally, is sometimes known as 8K. Now, the other confusing thing is we've moved into talking about horizontal pixels. 1080 was vertical. Now we're doing horizontal pixels, and the marketing guys like it because the numbers are bigger. It's, uh, <laughs> that is, I presume, the reason. But um, that's not all, because... We have an idea of where we want to get to with UHD1, but people want to launch services sooner. So the DVB project, Digital Video Broadcasting, which is the European sort of overarching worldwide but principally European system, um, has defined UHD1 phase one and phase two. Phase one is what we could do fairly soon, and phase two is what we could do a little bit later. The manufacturers want to start selling those TVs already, and we nearly had a phase naught, which that, that one over there is phase naught. It's um, not actually compatible with what we might broadcast, but they make very nice pictures, and I'll talk more about that later and where we are with that. So, UHD2, 
really it's the Japanese, NHK, the Japanese equivalent of the BBC, who are developing it. And the idea behind it is that it subtends a viewing angle to the viewer of 100 degrees. So it's totally immersive. You, you hardly notice the edge of the screen. You're just looking at the screen and what goes on at the edges doesn't matter so much. So you're sitting very close, three quarters of the picture height. For high definition, we reckon you probably want to sit about three times the picture height from the screen. Um, UHD 2, three quarters picture height. Uh, and that's equivalent to an A3 sized tablet at arm's length or a 65 inch screen at a viewing distance of just over two foot, that's pretty close, or um, a 100, 200 inch screen at a viewing distance of two meters. Now, can you fit a 200 inch screen in your living room? I, last time I gave a talk, I, I jokingly said, and I don't suppose anyone's got a 108 inch TV yet, and two people put up their hands to say they had. It was a specialist television audience. There aren't, I don't know how many 108 inch you've sold at Richer Sounds. Not many, I guess. They're, Pretty expensive and difficult to get through doorways. But <laughs> anyway, um, we are working with NHK on this. We're not totally convinced you need to go quite this far, though. But the other thing NHK are working on is the sound, of course. And we've got 5.1 surround now, 7.1 in the cinema. NHK have been working on the super high vision system uses 22.2 surround sound. So you've got a layer of speakers at the bottom, in the middle and above you, two subwoofers. I don't know quite why you need two because the whole idea is they're not directional, but um, hey. And um, yes, I, it, it, it's, I, I suspect it's um, the numbers game again. It's a bigger number. But um, there we are. Uh, we have some other ideas in the BBC which we're working on, um, but sound is, is an important part. More realistic sound is an important part of the next generation of television. So what have we done over the years with NHK? Well, in 2008 we did a live link from London, pictures of um, Tower Bridge sent live to IBC, the International Broadcasting Convention in Amsterdam in 2008. And uh, that kept some of us quite busy. Then in 2010, okay, Amsterdam's not far away. Let's see if we can do a test right the way from London to Tokyo. And this was proving test for what we were intending to demonstrate for the 2012 Olympics live delivery of 8K television halfway around the world over IP networks. And we had two official tests. We did some pre-tests to make sure that the press release and such like wasn't going to fall flat on its face. But the two principal tests, um, Radio 6 Music had <laughs> some really high resolution pictures to go with their radio um, with the charlatans and Taekwondo was a sport that we thought might have a good Olympic medal prospects and uh, they were keen to come along and get involved as well. So we had two days of tests. There's the camera. It's a big beast um, with a large piece of, la of glass on the front. And um, I think that had four sensors in it rather than just three. And there's two and a half inch sensors, so uh, quite something. So there we are recording the charlatans and this was in our experimental studio in Television Centre which is now of course closed. And there we are, we had, um, we had a 103 inch screen in another room in Television Centre to do local demonstrations. And this was the Taekwondo. <laughs> you can immediately see the problem, they move quite fast and uh, I'll come on to that later. <laughs> So we then, um, having proved that it would work in 2010, 
in 2012 in conjunction with the BBC with being the Olympic broadcaster, NHK, the Olympic Broadcasting Service, we put together a complete three weeks of demos around the Olympics. And NHK sent 30, 40 people over for two months. It was a big investment from NHK's point of view. Um, it was a big investment from the BBC, but we don't have that many people, but <laughs> not in research who were able to work on this, but uh, it, it, it was a very big project for us. And we did live and pre-prepared demos over the internet, presented on large screen theatres in Glasgow, in Bradford at the National Media Museum, uh, okay, yeah, um, in London at Broadcasting House, in New York, and three locations in Japan. So, uh, and it all, it all worked. We had backups in case things didn't quite work out, and we had to fall back on the backups, but, uh, and one occasion we fell back on the back backup, but uh, it all worked. It um, was really, I mean, it's, none of this is broadcast kit. It's all prototype kit, but we were able to send these enormously high resolution pictures halfway around the world. So uh, there we are. That's one of the theatres um, in the UK. That's the camera. Um, this is our control room. We used our experimental studio as the production centre. Uh, it was 24-hour operation. So uh, I was there overnight on some occasions because if the fire alarms had gone off, the Japanese would have stuck to their posts and I'd have had to have dragged them out of the building if the fire alarms had gone off. And... Um, so yes, we did demonstrations all over the place and very well received. And what the Japanese have announced, no one has announced when they're going to launch a UHD-1 service, but the Japanese have announced they're launching a UHD-2 service with the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Um, that's quite an ambitious target, but... Uh, being the Japanese, they've, they've set themselves an ambitious target and uh, they're going for it. So, UHD cameras. Um, you've seen the, the Japanese 8K cameras, they're big. So I'm now going to talk about 4K, what we can practically do present. And the first, as with the first HD cameras, which use large sensors, we're finding ourselves in the same situation with UHD. So we have cameras like two Sony cameras, the Red Dragon, large format sensors, large lenses, film type cameras really. And uh, really quite tricky to use for television because they've got a shallow depth of field and they're really designed for digital cinema where <laughs> a d shallow depth of field is what the cameraman wants. Not for sports coverage. Um, where you actually want the whole of the football pitch to be in focus, not just the blade of grass on the centre line. And sport also needs higher frame rates. And uh, you see this when uh, players are running around on a football field, if they're at 4K resolution, they don't have to move very far before they blur out across four or five pixels. So you need a very short shutter, and if you have a short shutter, then they judder. I'll come on to that later. So higher frame rates are important, certainly for sports coverage. Now, Panasonic showed this very useful camera at NAB um, last month in Las Vegas. Three sensor camera, traditional television type camera, two thirds inch sensor, therefore takes a standard size television lens, same depth of field, same everything that we're used to, and will run up to 120 frames a second. So uh, this is what we've been waiting for. I haven't got my hands on one yet, but uh, they haven't actually launched, <laughs> they've shown it at NAB, they haven't actually got any available to try or sell yet, but uh, later this year. So where are we? Um, the document underpinning ultra-high definition is um, International Telecommunications Union 
document uh, BT2020, which is an appropriate number because uh, Japanese want to launch in 2020. And uh, I, I'm lucky, I've managed to avoid two weeks of tedium sitting in Geneva whilst they decide exactly how they're going to arrange their meetings. Um, you never know in advance which day your meeting is going to be, so you have to be there for the whole week. Um, I've managed to avoid that somehow. But they standardised the resolution. They have standardised a wider colour gamut, an option of constant luminance. I'll explain all of these shortly. Greater bit depth and higher frame rates. What they haven't yet standardised is a higher or extended dynamic range. That's something which is causing us some interesting thoughts at the moment. So, the wider colour gamut. This is a U dash V dash diagram. Um, most people show an XY diagram, which is visually non uniform and exaggerates the area that television doesn't cover. So, ITU recommendation 709 is what we use for high definition. Virtually the same as we used for standard definition. And that larger triangle is the ITU recommendation 2020 colour space. For comparison, the one in between is Digital Cinema P3, which is what Digital Cinema currently aims to do. And that dashed line is Mike Pointer's gamut of real surface colours. Measured, he measured 4,000 colours, and uh, if you can reproduce those, you can do everything you're likely to see, except for neon signs. <laughs> so, um, actually, the REC 2020 gamut does cover that quite well. So there we are. High definition, we have 709, UHD TV 2020, colorimetry. But not everyone is convinced that we need to change. And whereas the ITU has specified 2020 colorimetry for 2020, the SMPTE in the States has said, oh, that's too difficult. We'll retain the option of using recommendation 709 colorimetry for UHD. And then the film side of the SMPTE. Um, the MP stands for moving pictures and the T stands for television, so there's always that tension there. The film side would like us to join them using the XYZ system. That's fine for them. They can distribute their films on a hard disk. We, we actually have to send them over the air. We have to compress efficiently. And XYZ is inherently very wasteful. It can include every single colour you could ever want and about as many that are actually octarine in Terry Pratchett probably is outside the human visual system, but it can encode all of those, including the ones that we, we um, don't exist. Um, so we're, we're resisting that because we want television needs to be efficient. Constant luminance, uh, quite tricky to explain but quite simple in concept, actually. Conventional television and computer imagery and everything we do at the moment takes the red, the green, and the blue signals and then gamma corrects them to R dash, G dash, and B dash. And we form a luma signal and a chroma signals matrixed from those gamma corrected RGB. And then we bandwidth limit the chroma channels. Now that's the problem, that's why there is a failure, failure of constant luminance in the current television system. Because it results in a proportion of what the eye perceives as luminance travels through the chroma channels and so is band limited. So we are losing resolution by doing this. And some of the high frequency chrominance information, which the eye cannot see, is travelling in the luma channel so is consuming bandwidth unnecessarily so the current television system is slightly inefficient we've not managed to quantify how inefficient but it, it's probably less than five percent um, but we'd like to avoid that so constant luminance tries to rectify this 
by forming true luminance signals by from the RGB signals before gamma correction. That's how the eye works. And if the television system works the same way as the eye does, then it's easier to throw away what the eye can't see. So that's the idea of that. It's available as an option in REC 2020, but there's resistance to its adoption because it's different, it's new. <laughs> it's not new. It was proposed 50 years ago. We nearly got it into high definition into REC 709 25 years ago, 20 years ago, but um, uh, that was standardised at a meeting where no one who was present at the meeting actually understood what they were doing. And uh, <laughs> as a result of which, that's why there is a different e luminance and chrominance equation for REC 709 from standard definition, because they didn't actually understand that it, they could, might as well, if they weren't going to have constant luminance, they could have kept the old equation because it made no difference, really. Um, but they adopted the equation they'd have used had we had constant luminance, in spite of the fact we weren't using it. So um, there we go. Greater bit depth. And already we produce high definition at 10 bits, but we only transmit 8 bits. And what we want to do for UHD is produce at 12 bits and transmit at 10 bits. Now, UHD phase naught can only cope with 8 bits. Computers, it's really hard to find a graphics card that will do more than 8 bits per colour. Um, but we have shown that actually it's more efficient. <laughs> you might think that going to 10 bits, you'd need... 25% more bandwidth, but actually it's more efficient to code 10 bits than 8 bits because there's more, there's more to throw away and you can throw it away better if you have a better starting position. Um, you get a visually better result at a lower bit rate by using a 10-bit system. Now, that, that 10 bits is in the gamma-corrected non-linear world. It gets very confusing because people talk about film using 14 bits and such like. Well, yes, and the cameras use 14 or 16 bits out of the back of the camera, but those are linear bits, not gamma-corrected bits, and uh, it all gets very messy when you're at an international standards meeting and half of the world doesn't understand what gamma is. Higher frame rate. So... Even at HD resolutions, we find that motion blur during camera, due to camera integration is reducing the resolution of the moving image. Uh, we discovered that with the first experimental football broadcasts in high definition where things moved and people started to feel nauseous because... When things moved, they went blurred. When they stopped moving, they went sharp. Too much get aperture correction, they went very sharp and then blurred again. And the human visual system tells the brain that there's something wrong with your eyes if images go in and out of focus. You must have eaten something poisonous. So <laughs> the obvious effect is that you feel nauseous. Um, and we think that's the mechanism. And it was solved by reducing the aperture correction in the camera, because after all, you've got more resolution, so you don't need to artificially boost the resolution in the way that you did at standard definition. And you can't slow down the pan rate, because if the football's going across there, you can't... <laughs> oh, you've got to keep up with the ball. What you can do is shorten the shutter slightly to sharpen the images as it moves. And one of the demos that we shot was this one. The, uh, the, the camera is tracking the cyclist, but the background, with a shorter shutter shorter shutter, is, the background is sharper um, with a longer shutter um, or a lower frame rate, the background is softer. Does that matter? Well, maybe not in a film, but maybe it does in um, a football match. I'll come on to that. So, if you think of a football match, um, as it pans, everything becomes blurred, except for the thing you happen to be following. Um, and as you increase the resolution, so the amount of blurring, that difference between the static resolution and the dynamic resolution increases. 
So um, if you move the camera, you can't see much difference between high definition and standard definition um, if you're moving the camera. You can see the difference at standard definition, but it's, it's uh, different um, when, as soon as you move the camera. So there we are. I've talked about nausea. Um, really, what it means is that the higher the static resolution, so the higher the dynamic resolution must be for comfortable and lifelike images. Now, of course, TVs already claim to be doing 100, 200, 240, 600 hertz. Uh, what are they doing? They're taking in the 50 or 60 frames per second that we're transmitting, and they're interpolating up to higher frame rates to solve the problem of flicker and smearing in the display. Uh, it's purely to solve problems with liquid crystal displays, really, and plasma displays that they went to higher frame rates within the display. It does nothing for the motion blur that you capture in the camera as it pans. And they can't predict complex motion. The, the motion sometimes looks very strange. To make it more lifelike, make the motion more lifelike, in, particularly in sports, we need higher frame rates in the camera, in distribution, and in the display. So that is what I persuaded the Japanese to adopt because they could see the same problem and they were having difficulty persuading their management that they needed to increase the frame rate. Um, I and a Japanese colleague persuaded the Japanese management that they needed to take this seriously and hence it's um, gone into the standards. But what I was basing this on initially was if standard definition is acceptable at 50 frames a second, then full high definition, three times the horizontal resolution, needs 100 or maybe 150 frames per second. So do, when we go to 4K, do we need 300 frames per second? That, that was my understanding <laughs> when I presented higher frame rates here in 2008. Now, we think probably not, fortunately. Um, and we need to think of the whole system um, how we can accommodate higher frame rates. We need to think about flicker in the display. To define what the frame rate should be, we need to think of the length of the shutter opening for sharp images, the ability of the human visual system to fuse a series of images on the screen, lighting issues in the studio, and the noise performance of the system. So flicker in the display, easily dealt with, NHK's tests and work that we'd done previously all indicated that if you get above 80 frames per second, you eliminate flicker. And then NHK also did some work which showed that to freeze the motion adequately for human vision, you needed a shutter opening below 1 320th of a second. So that's pretty close to the 300 hertz that I'd initially thought. Sony did some sim similar tests to NHK between 60 and 480 frames per second and came to the conclusion that you need about 250 frames per second to prevent blur. So not so far away from what NHK had done either. Now, the human visual system tracking motion, uh, we need to consider trackable motion, what the eye can follow, non-trackable motion, which the eye cannot follow, and multiple trackable motions. You could track one of them, but not the other. And, of course, the television system doesn't know which of my hands you're wa watching. So, linear motion, the eye can track and join the dots. And the, the dots are short caused by the short shutter opening to prevent it blurring. So, where, what frame rate do we need to enable the eye to join the dots? And the tests that we've done, as NHK have done, suggest that 100 to 120 frames per second may actually be sufficient. Non-trackable motion, the bowler's arm, is rotating. The eyeball does not rotate in its socket, so you can't track rotating motion. So the, the um, 
bowler's arm, you'll notice it on television. They often shoot cricket with a short shutter so that everything is sharp. But the bowler's arm, you see multiple arms. You don't see a smooth motion. You see a whole series of arms rotating. Same, the demo here at the end, you'll see uh, with the juggling, the juggles are rotating and the eye cannot track that. You see a whole load of individual juggles as they rotate rather than smooth motion. And then there's trackable motion that the eye isn't tracking. Now the camera can pan to follow the ball, the player's running that way or the player's running that way. Um, they're not tracking the crowd and which of the players running about is it tracking. So you've got, you always have motion that the camera is not tracking in, in sport. And you'll see that, in fact, there's some hurdling also on the demo down here. And there you've got bits of hurdlers <laughs> going in different directions as they jump over the hurdles. And you can't, you can't track all of them with the camera. We had a brilliant cameraman uh, from Birmingham, <laughs> camera lady from Birmingham, who did uh, a, an incredible job, given that we didn't actually have remotable zoom and focus. So she was trying to zoom and focus and pan at the same time. I, d I don't know how she did it. She managed it on some of the shots and uh, uh, the results are there. So the conclusion of this was that we needed above 100 frames per second to merge trackable motion. Uh, maybe we don't worry about the non-trackable motion for the present. Hence the current standard, which we've got into the standards of 100 in Europe and 120 in 60 hertz countries. Shutter opening, so Sony also said you need above 250 frames per second to prevent jerkiness. So this is the motion that you can't track. And they've suggested 240 frames per second for compatibility with 24 and 60 hertz. Well, of course, we'd like compatibility with 50 as well. Um, so maybe that's 600 but um, because that gives compatibility with 24 and 25 and 30 and 60 and 50 and 120. Um, so what we now need to judge is what's the relative importance of trackable motion where 100 frames per second is adequate and untracked motion where we have a suspicion from some of the work one of my colleagues has done that actually we might need 1400 frames per second believe it or not. Uh, or 700, depending on... <laughs> I mean, we, we haven't finished that work yet. It's really hard to do this sort of work. Um, present, it comes down to what's feasible, and 100, 120 is feasible, 700 is not. So uh, that's we've got to leave something for the next generation of engineers. <laughs> so could we cope with 120 hertz as a single worldwide standard? in terms of lighting, tungsten, fluorescent tubes, HMR lights, LED lights. So we did a study of that and concluded that, yeah, LED lights are fine, but actually we have no control over the lighting in sports stadium. Um, we can't say to all the sports stadia in the country, sorry, you've got to change all your lights. Some of them were only installed last year and are not suitable for higher frame rates, um, except 100 hertz, because, of course, the the mains has 250, uh, two cycles in 100 hertz, and that equates to two power peaks. So 100 hertz does work. And um, so what we have managed to get into the international standards documents is that there is an intention to use 100 frames per second in Europe, so they better take notice of that. You can't just ignore Europe or China, which is a 50 hertz country. So. We've got that into the standards documents alongside 120. There's still an argument about whether the Americans, the Americans don't think you need 119.88 for the um, compatibility with NTSC. The Japanese think you might do. So it's, um, there's still an enormous debate going on. Noise performance. If you shorten the shutter, you've got more noise in the camera physics. Um, how does the human visual system though deal with noise in at higher frame rates well it integrates out noise so you can probably tolerate 
higher noise at higher frame rates, higher video noise. Um, but what we don't know is, is the relationship linear? Is there a penalty? Could there even be an advantage in going to higher frame rates in terms of noise? We don't know what the human visual system's characteristics are with that. It's something that we, we want to study, but uh, we've, it's always been pushed down because there are more important things to do. Because we haven't, actually can't do anything about it. Um, if you think about it, of course, a one-bit projector, a DLP projector is a one-bit projector running at a very high frame rate. So uh, you can cope with an incredible amount of noise at a very high frame rate. And it's the same with one-bit audio systems. Um, so could we have a one-bit, very high frame rate video system? Oh, we could count photons. Just send us a pulse every time a photon happens. That's very similar to what happens in the human eye. So, uh, yeah, it's not the highest priority to look at this, but it's something we want to look at at some stage. Um, it's not the highest priority because one of the highest priorities is to look at higher or extended dynamic range. It's not yet standardised. One of my colleagues has picked up the job of being ITU's rapporteur, chairing, chairing the rapporteur's group on extended dynamic range. There are a variety of proposals put forward. We've put forward a proposal of our own from the BBC. There are four or five proposals now currently being dis considered. There's that old television maxim that an ounce of contrast is worth a whole heap of resolution. And uh, that is certainly true. If you increase the contrast, it looks like you've got sharper pictures. It's, it fools the eye um, into thinking the pictures are nice and well. The pictures are nicer, <laughs> but how do you get there? What do we do to the television system to increase the dynamic range? It's not straightforward. And keep it compatible. Some of the manufacturers and the Hollywood people say, oh, we, could, we can do two grades. I mean, we've got 96 different film distributions. We can double that again with two different grades for two different contrast ratios. Um, no broadcaster is going to be able to double its grading budget. Um, it's expensive enough as it is. So there we are. We have all of those factors in 2020. The only one that's currently in that TV set is the um, 3840 by 2160. I think it's got a wider colour gamut natively, but there's no um, television signal to drive that. So Displays, where are we with television displays? Because it's actually the availability of these displays that is driving the television world at the moment. So we have, basically this is what I'm going to go through in the next bit of the presentation, so I'll, I'll get straight on with it. 4K displays. In 2013, we were expecting 85% of the sales of 4K televisions by which I mean 3840 by 2160, to be in China. In fact, 95% of the sales were in China. The Chinese have decided that 4K is their unique, se se unique selling point. Um, and the only way to sell as many panels as they are producing is to cut prices and if you want to cut prices you have to cut the spec of what you're selling. So the majority of these Chinese, and they're, they're on sale in Europe now under a thousand pounds for a 4K TV set. So it's a 4K panel. It may have an HD or a 4K input running at only 25 frames per second so sport's not going to look great on it. All of the processing is done at HD resolution. So it may be a 4K panel, but it's not a 4K TV set. Very poor up conversion. Having done the processing at HD, the up conversion to put it onto the screen is very poor. And the out light output is very poor. Now that is not what we've got there. Um, LG, Samsung, Panasonic, Sony, uh, the, the well-known brands have done very well and made very nice TV sets. The uh, 
Chinese are cutting costs and hoping to win on price rather than quality. So what's going on in the rest of the world? Um, well, there's lots of hype and there was lots of 4K TV sets at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. And one of the press release, well, no, it was um, an article that came out at that time, said, um, little demand for, computer, for consumer 4K, survey says. So what did the survey say? It said only 18% of uh, their survey of 1,000 US adults was very interested, and 40% somewhat interested in purchasing a 4K or Ultra HD television. Um, and 16% were not at all interested in 4K technology. So what does that mean? Well, it means that 58% are interested, so <laughs> we can't just dismiss it. Where are we with professional displays? Because actually, if we're going to make higher resolution TV programs, we need to have some equipment. Uh, there's nothing above 50 or 60 frames per second. Those monitors I've got there are games monitors. Very poor angle of view intended for one guy sitting in front of his computer, games driven from a computer. So we're using those to demonstrate the higher frame rates, but we haven't yet seen any higher frame rate televisions. We need 10-bit, probably eventually 12-bit, but 10-bit's a good start. 2020 colorimetry, I only know of one 2020 colorimetry display, and that's at NHK's research labs, and I haven't yet seen it. I'm hoping to see it in the next month. Canon released a 4K, and this, it is 4K. It's um, 4096 by 2560, so it's actually a 4x3, but you can put your 4K and then have some metadata or some bar graphs or some meters underneath as well. Uh, quite an interesting TV set, uh, sorry, monitor, professional monitor released last November. Um, Sony have had 4K monitors uh, for about a year now and were showing OLED, 30 inch OLED prototypes and a 56 inch OLED prototype last year as well. I'll explain about OLED later. I need to speed up if I'm going to get through to there though. Panasonic have a 4K plasma prototype and a 31 HD OLED monitor planned and have a 4K LCD um, which shipped in March. I know that because we managed to buy one. Now, CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, is uh, all about the world's largest. It's in Las Vegas, and everything, size is everything in Las Vegas. So here we go. 84 inches used to impress. Uh, now we have 95 inches, 98 inches, 105 inches, 110 inches, and 120 inches. An LCD TV from Vizio using glass from Sharp's 10th generation fab plant in Japan. The interesting thing about that plant is it's the last LCD plant that will ever be built in Japan. It just takes up too much real estate and that costs a lot of money in Japan. So that it'll be Korea and China and Taiwan in the future. Uh, and it's also about the world's first. So Samsung had the world's first 105-inch curved 4K LCD TV. There we are. Uh, now, why do you want a curved TV? Well, I'll explain later. LG had the first 105-inch. Toshiba had the first 105-inch. <laughs> there we go. So, if you have a flat screen, you have, yeah, a sort of... You may be looking straight on in the centre, but over at the sides, you're looking at quite an angle. If you make the screen curved, that angle is reduced. Therefore, the problem that an LCD screen has in viewing angle is reduced on a larger screen. And it works for the guy sitting next to you as well, or your wife, or significant other. So we have curved 
LCDs and OLEDs from Samsung, LG, Sony, Toshiba, and a whole load of companies you've not yet heard of, um, but will do because they're the Chinese guys who are coming along very rapidly. And uh, then you have 21 by 9, or possibly 64 by 27. Um, the numbers work out in pixels best that way. 4K or even 5K, some of the screens are 105 inch curved screens from Samsung, LG and Toshiba, and even one flexible OLED screen which was motorised so that you can have it flat or curved depending on your preference. There you are, you can have everything. And projectors aren't quite dead, well they are, but um, <laughs> Sony <laughs> trying to keep them alive with this wonderful little projector which sits on the floor underneath your wall very close, six inches away from the wall, and projects a uh, large image onto the wall. It's a quite incredible projector. It's a 4K three-chip um, three projector. Very, very impressive spec. So um, a bit about display technology. Um, LEDs are now, well, I'll, I'll go through them and explain as we go. So traditional backlights for LCD screens. LCD screen is transparent and has a backlight on it which is modulated by the screen. So traditionally we've used cold cathode fluorescence but now with LEDs approaching 50% efficiency they are all but universal. Um, it, you can reduce the power consumption of the TV and every two years the power consumption of L L LEDs halves. But they got to 50% efficiency. Um, it, it, it's hard to go from 50% to 100%, and you're never going to get beyond 100%. So that halving, doubling of efficiency every two years is not going to carry on. So L LEDs have just about reached the limit. So what do you do? Uh, the blue LED is the most efficient of the three. And these things called quantum dots are high-efficiency phosphors very small phosphor dots uh, which convert blue light into red and green very efficiently so you can get another 20% power efficiency by going to quantum dots um, so that's the big new thing currently so um, currently you have an edge lit TV with RGB LEDs along the bottom with a a very clever piece of plastic in between which distributes the light evenly all over the screen. And with quantum dots, you just have blue LEDs along the edge and red and green quantum dots embedded in that backlight behind. Oh, as many different ways of doing it as there are manufacturers, but uh, that's, that's the essence of it. IGZO, uh, patented by... Japanese, Japan Science and Technology, licensed to Samson Sharp. It's a transparent semiconductor. Its advantage over zinc oxide is it suits the manufacturing process better. It has much better electron mobility than amorphous silicon. You can have smaller transistors, higher efficiency, that can hold their charge if the image is unchanged. So you don't need to consume electricity, re-driving the pixel if it's going to stay the same. It can be used for LCD. It enables the next generation of larger OLED screens. It's ideal for mobile devices because it reduces power consumption, but IGZO yields are still a challenge. Sharp made a big thing at CES of having masterminded IGZO manufacture. LG use it in a 4K TV set. Fujitsu use it in a computer, um, laptop computer screen. Next new technology, the Sharp Quatron Plus. Um, it's a solution looking for a problem. Um, <laughs> but it's a solution looking for a problem that does actually exist this time. What it enables is effectively 4K viewing at half the price of 
a true 4K screen. So it's a good way of reducing prices or increasing resolution for the same price, depending on how you look at it. Um, go back a year, because Quatron Plus is obviously a development of Quatron. So Quatron was an RGB, red, green, blue, and yellow pixel format. So the green and the yellow give you two peaks of luminance in one pixel. So that effectively allowed you to have a 1920 by 1080 panel producing a resolution of 4K by only 1080. So it's giving you improved horizontal resolution but doing nothing vertically. And it looks like that. Red, green, blue and yellow in each pixel. Quatron Plus, you like the buzzwords these manufacturers come up with, revelation technology. It um, splits the RGB and Y subpixel vertically to give you effectively 3840 by 2160 full 4K resolution, except it's not quite because you're using green and yellow as your two peaks, but you've split it vertically. So th that is what they demonstrated at uh, Las Vegas this year. And the interesting thing is what they're proposing to do next year, apply the technology to a 3840 by 2160 panel to deliver a UHD2, um, an 8K panel, effectively, at a reasonable price. So this is one of the Japanese developments that will enable the launch of UHD in 2020. OLEDs, organic LEDs, um, They've been marketed as organic, so they must be better because they don't have carbon in them. Um, yes. <laughs> so, um, or do have carbon, whichever way around it is. Anyway, <laughs> um, but the great thing about IGZO is that it helps provide the backplane technology that's required for really large OLED displays. Um, and as LCD, even with quantum dots and, OLED, uh, and LED backlights, is approaching its maximum efficiency, uh, OLEDs could go beyond that. Uh, so we're talking about 80 to 90 percent power reduction for basically static images. Um, and OLEDs reducing power consumption by another 83 percent. So there's, you can do a lot of power consumption reduction in the future. However, OLEDs are still a, a problem in the manufacture in getting the yields up. The yields are low. And IGZO has a problem with low yield. So if you multiply two low yields together, you get an extremely low yield. So engineers like a challenge. Of course, they're not going to be defeated yet. Uh, they will be solved, but <laughs> it's not easy. So a little bit about resolution, because we're talking about 4K or 8K or whatever, what resolution do we need? So we've got that RGB triplet. If you're not sharp Quatron Plus, you've got an RGB triplet forming a pixel. So each pixel is not an ideal Gaussian spot that we had with the CRT. It, it is a, a red lump, a green lump, and a blue lump. And in signal processing terms, that's a boxcar. Uh, output which causes all sorts of problems with resolution and the representation of resolution. So you really need a higher resolution display than you might think for pixel mapping. So the computer guys say, oh no, we just map all the pixels and that's perfect. Um, but no, actually, television is an analog signal that has been digitized and if you put them as RGB triplets, it's not matching the human visual system. So you want a higher resolution display than the TV signal for best quality. So 4K displays will show HD pictures to their best quality. And if that HD picture has been captured using a 4K camera, even better. So um, there's some way to go before we need to move from HD to UHD for transmission, which is just as well because we're still converting our TV channels from standard definition to high definition and asking a broadcaster to suddenly 
change to yet another technology when they haven't finished their 10-year investment cycle on the previous one is, is really quite hard. In domestic living rooms, the average viewing distance is 2.7 metres, and that doesn't really change because living rooms tend not to get bigger. Um, and HD, HD broadcasts will work very well on 4K TVs up to 75 inches. It's only once you start getting above 75 inches that uh, you really benefit from uh, something more than high definition. So um, when will more than 10% of homes have 80-inch diagonal TV sets? That's when we need to start broadcasting 4K TV. But... 4K tablets are starting to come along, and actually, if you have a TV screen that you're holding at arm's length, then, yeah, you start to want 4K on that. So it's not just TVs we need to think about. So what are we doing at the moment? We are already experimenting with 4K for drama and natural history. If you're making a natural history blockbuster as our guys do down in Bristol. The lead time is three years shooting and a year's post-production. So they need to be using the very latest technology now so that in four years' time it doesn't look out of date. And they did that with HD. They were the first bit of the BBC really to adopt HD. They're the first bit of the BBC to adopt 4K. They find lugging a, a Sony F65 across a mountain range a bit of a challenge. Um, the, as with HD, where the Panasonic Varicam the, the, guys, the natural history guys at Bristol picked up the Vericam and did some incredible things with it. Um, the guy I was working with then and myself, we looked at the Vericam and we couldn't work out how the natural history unit got such wonderful pictures out of it. There is some magic down there in Bristol. It's, uh, and the pictures they got from that HD Vericam were stunning. The Panasonic, this new 4K Vericam, is going to be very interesting. They're going to love that, I think. UHD Phase 1 would be possible next year if you just wanted to do a film channel. Now, yeah, there are broadcasters who might just want to do a film channel, but those broadcasters actually want to do sport as well. So you might have to wait for full UHD, and we're, we're really looking at 2017, 2020. We're doing experiments. We're doing stuff at the Commonwealth Games. We've done... Well, we've done the Olympics, as I said. Um, so we're experimenting. But actually launching a service really is still a few years away. And not just the BBC, other broadcasters as well. No one is committing to it at the moment, except the Japanese, of course. And then, I, might we go... If the Japanese are doing UHD 2 in 2020, might we skip straight to UHD 2 um, if we're looking at... 2017 to 20 as a time frame. Maybe we just wait and uh, the Japanese will show us how to do everything. Or do we actually need 8K? How many 150-inch TVs are we going to have in domestic living rooms? Um, probably not many. So, yeah, that fence hasn't yet been built, so I can't yet sit on it. It's, uh, we are at that situation. So uh, thank you very much. Um,